Okay, so I suppose we should probably get going here, Phil. So let me just say a, a brief word. So Phil, I'm very proud of this accomplishment, by the way, and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for, I think, about four or five years now, I think it's yeah. been. Yeah. And we've been working on this project for well over a year. You have been doing all of the hard work, uh, taking on a very advanced and challenging master's thesis, which I think is absolutely top notch. So without further ado, Phil, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, so to read my own saga then, um, it's, it's traditionally been counted among the genre of Old Norse and Old Icelandic literature known as Riddara Saga or chivalric or romance sagas. And until relatively recently, scholars had not paid much attention to this particular genre, especially compared with other sort of better known and seemingly more highly regarded genres, such as the Fornalda saga or legendary sagas, the Kanunga saga or king sagas, and the Islandica saga, the sagas of Icelanders. But the number of surviving manuscripts containing these stories tells us that they must have been incredibly popular. And this is certainly the case for Joy Me Own Saga, which survives in well over 50 manuscripts, ranging from the mid to late 14th century, all the way through to the 19th. So the aim of my project was to produce a digital edition of Joy Me Own Saga. And there's been two previous editions of note, there's a German edition published in 1894 by Hugo Gering and an English edition by Page in 1957. Both of these are based on a different manuscript from the one that I use for this project, though, which has the catalogue label AM657 AB Corso, and it's a 14th century manuscript and one of the early surviving manuscripts to contain the saga possibly even the oldest. So I've encoded the text as a Minota compliant XML file. Now Minota stands for Medieval Nordic Text Archive, and they've basically taken standards developed by the Text Encoding Initiative and extended them to deal with some of the complexities of encoding the Medieval Nordic texts, such as the high number of spelling variations and the number of abbreviations. So Minota has a catalogue of compliant texts on their website, which visitors can view online, or they can download the raw XML files for their own use. Um, so my encoding includes all three layers supported by the Minota framework. So that's a facsimile text, which tries to capture the manuscript itself as closely as you can do that in the text representation in terms of capturing the spelling, abbreviations, punctuation, text layout, and various other paragraphic characteristics. Then there's a diplomatic text, which essentially just expands all the abbreviations and standardizes the characters in line with the modern Latin alphabet. And a normalized text, which attempts to make the text more accessible for a modern reader by standardizing the spelling and grammar. So it smooths out all the spelling variations, for example, as modern punctuation and so on. Um, in keeping with the Minota guidelines, I've normalized the text according to the Dictionary of Old Norse Prose, which effectively reconstructs Old Norse as it might have been around 1200 to 1250, though probably closer to 1200. And finally, I produced an English translation of the saga, which as far as I can tell is the first time the whole saga has been published in English. So in the saga itself, um, Jorn, or to use the anglicised name, John, is a young smith who can not only interpret dreams, but he also knows what a person has dreamt before they tell him. 
So he's introduced through a subplot involving a rich farmer named Asgard, who's dreamt of fires breaking out across his land. John correctly guesses his dream and interprets the places where the fires break out as locations where valuables have previously been hidden by warriors returning from raids. Earl Heinrich of Saxland, who is himself a renowned interpreter of dreams, learns of John's skills and enlists his help. At first, Heinrich takes full credit for John's insights, but pretty soon he covets John's skills for himself. John tells him his abilities can't be taught, so he hatches a plan to steal them by eating John's heart. Heinrich orders his wife Ingeborg to creep into John's room and murder him while he sleeps, then cut out his heart and prepare it in a meal. Heinrich is finally un undone. Sorry, uh, Ingeborg can't go through with this and it confesses the plot to John. Um, so they hatch a plan to deceive Heinrich by substituting the dog's heart and substituting a, max wa a wax mannequin to stand in for John at his funeral. Heinrich is finally undone when the Emperor of Saxland, who is Ingeborg's brother, arrives with a dream involving people submerged to various heights in flood water, which he wants Heinrich to divine and interpret. The Emperor quickly discovers John is dead and he's brought before him to tell and interpret the dream. John tells him the dream reveals his queen's adultery with her Flemish servant, with the complicity of his closest advisors. The saga ends with the exile of Heinrich and the Emperor's queen, and a kind of happy ever after as John is married to Ingeborg and receives the earldom. <coughs> so, Draw Me On Saga has traditionally been included in the genre of Old Norse literature known as Riddler Saga, the so called chivalric or romance sagas, also very, variously known as Ligia Saga or Lie Sagas, Fornalda Saga, Sutherlander, Ancient Sagas of the South, and Merchant Sagas or Fairy Tale Sagas. The term reader to describe a form of literature telling of nightly adventures dates to the Middle Ages, and Marian Kalinka describes them as a genre of literary works peopled by knights and ladies, by kings and queens, by princes and princesses, the aggregate of feudal aristocracy. The work generally thought to be the first reader Saga, Tristram Saga Ock Isandere, dates to the 13th century and has a colophon in the text claiming that the work was translated by a brother Robert in 1226. But survivals of Norwegian manuscripts from that period, the 13th and 14th centuries, are scarce and we have to depend largely on later Icelandic copies which have quite often undergone many alterations during their transmission. Tristram Saga Ock Isandere, for example, is first attested in just four leaves from the 15th century, and we have to wait until paper manuscripts from the 17th century before we find the earliest complete text. The Riddler Saga genre itself went through a number of stages of development, it started out basically with Norwegian translations of foreign sources, but then the manuscripts start to show a growing independence from these foreign works as the texts slowly transform by changes introduced first by Norwegian and then Icelandic scribes. But despite changes to words, phrases, sometimes reorganization of events, the essence of the work was initially unaffected. The scribe's intention was still the transmission of someone else's text. But gradually, a kind of editorial authority started to emerge, 
with changes to content, structure, and style. Different text witnesses started to become different versions of the stories. And this evolution finally reached its fruition by the late Middle Ages, as Icelanders started to conceive their own plots and produce their own imitations. Foreign sources continued to provide inspiration, supplying names, characters, motifs, even complete events. But now, so too did Iceland's own indigenous literature, with its stories of Vikings, berserkers, trolls, and shapeshifters. And today we know of over 30 original romances composed in Iceland. So, given the knightly or chivalric court content, the boundaries between Riddarasurga and other Old Norse genres can often seem blurred. Peter Halberg noted that the Fornaldasurga in particular show many signs of having been more or less influenced by chivalric literature, its themes and vocabulary. And it's true that a number of Fornaldasurga could equally qualify as romances. <laughs> Scholars have largely been unsuccessful in clearly demarcating the genres. And Herman Paulson points out, whatever the origins of the materials of the Fonzalda saga, it should be plain enough that most of them belong, formally at least, to the romance tradition of medieval Europe. And for that reason, it would be a mistake to draw a sharp dividing line between them and the Riddler Saga and Ligia Saga. And as we'll see shortly, Troy Mion Saga, though traditionally counted as a Riddler Saga, is perhaps closer in spirit to another genre of Icelandic literature called Islandic Eifintiri or Icelandic Adventure which Jorgensen describes as short tales with explicit moralistic or didactic interpretations drawn from history, legends, the Bible, saints' lives, classical or vernacular literature, folk tales, and from fables, bestiaries, lapidaries, and proverbs. <clears throat> but the Riddarasurga and some later Fornaldasurga, known as adventure sagas, also exhibit certain recurring patterns. For example, Catherine Hume has identified the romance or fairy tale pattern, where a hero undertakes a quest or series of tests and ends by succeeding, marrying, and assuming power. A common variant of this is the bridal quest, which was particularly pop which was a particularly popular concern of medieval literature and prominent among uh, the Riddarasurga, both the translated and indigenous kind. This is probably not surprising given that what was probably the very first Norse romance, Tristram Saga of Isandere which mentioned, mentioned previously, was probably also the first pride request. And so undoubtedly it had an extremely influential effect on all those that followed. Though not a pride request per se, it's notable that Dreamy Young Saga concludes with a lavish wedding of John to Ingeborg, the wife of his disgraced and exiled enemy, the Earl. So, as I said at the beginning, until probably at least the second half of the 20th century, Rida and Serga were considered a minor gen genre and received relatively little academic attention. The literary scholar W.P. Kerr summed up the general attitude um, towards them at the beginning of the 20th century with the statement, they are among the most dreariest things ever made by human fancy. 
but this is unfair and not really true. Judging by the number of surviving texts, they were evidently extremely popular with their contemporary audience. And today we have over 800 manuscripts containing these stories. And since many of those manuscripts have several individual sagas, we can account for over 1,500 individual text witnesses, albeit many of those are fragmentary. This number exceeds even that of the Icelandic sagas, and so it makes the Riddara saga the most tested form of Icelandic folk literature. The second half of the 20th century has certainly seen an upturn in scholarly interest, and previous outmoded attitudes are beginning to change. The volume of scholarship is continually growing and older scholarship is being re-examined and re-evaluated. In the words of Marianne Kalinka again, they're generally no longer considered medieval afterthought, nor the last dying gasp of a once great literature. Mm. Well, um, the author of Troy Beyond Saga seems to have drawn heavily on Oriental stories for the elements of the narrative. The Seven Sagas of Rome is a collection of Eastern morality tales that were popular in Europe in the Middle Ages. In one of its stories, Sapientes, Emperor Herod's seven counsellors, who can also interpret dreams, are not able to account for the Empress's sudden blindness. They're directed to a fatherless boy who turns out to be none other than Merlin, who, like John in our saga, can interpret unspoken dreams himself. When they locate him, he's interpreting for a man who's dreamt of a spring of water emerging from a dunghill. He interprets this as a sign of hidden gold, just like Farmer Asgard's dream of fires. He explains the emperor's blindness as the result of the evil conduct of his counsellors, who are consequently put to death. Alexander Crapper collected a very similar story from Turkish tribes in southern Siberia. An old woman journeys to some mothers about a dream involving snakes under her house. She encounters a boy who claims the mothers will be unable to interpret her dream, but he writes down his interpretation for the mothers to read to her, that the snakes symbolise buried gold under her house. Once again, the same idea as in Traumion. The mothers refuse to read it, and considering the boy arrival, they try to kill him. He tells them if they do, a new man will rise from his bed and kill them. So they let him go. Later, the king dreams his feet are immersed in water, with snakes crawling around his legs. A dream that clearly resonates with the emperor's dream in Dream Yons. The mothers are unable to explain this and bring the boy forward, who reveals that it foretells a plot by the mothers to kill the king. The mothers are put to death and the boy replaces them. So, as with Drawing Me On Saga, each of these stories introduces its protagonist by means of a dream about hidden cult. He then goes to court where the envy of a seer or seers threatens his life. Each story concludes with the protagonist interpreting the second dream that reveals the betrayal of the ruler's advisors. A well-read 14th century Icelandic author could easily have been familiar with Sapientis, and since oral and written stories also reached Iceland via Byzantium and Russia, it isn't beyond the bounds of possibility that the Turkish story might have reached him as well. So, when John arrives at Hyrex Court, the story follows a commonly encountered theme of rivalry between two court advisors. 
another oriental variant might have provided the source for this part, the legend of Ahikar the Wise. In this story, Ahikar's advisor to the Assyrian king, Sennacherib. He has no son to succeed him, so he adopts his nephew, Nardin. But Nardin's jealous of his uncle, and he forges evidence that appears to implicate Ahikar in a treasonous plot. Sennacherib consequently orders Ahikar's execution. But the executioner owes a debt to Ahikar, so he and his wife hide him instead and execute and bury a condemned criminal in his place. Nardin's outrageous behaviour then has the king regretting his decision, and when later, under threat of war, the pharaoh of Egypt demands that the king send him a sage to build a palace in the air and to answer riddles, Ahikar's executioner friend brings him back to the court. Ahikar returns from Egypt with gifts and honours. He's given permission to do as he wishes with Nardin, but instead of killing him directly, he preaches wisdom to him until Nardin literally explodes. The story is extremely old. An Aramaic fragment dates to the 5th century BC, and it's mentioned in the much earlier Book of Tobit. The number of ancient Indo-European versions of the story also suggests that it probably derived from a single ancient source. So Jeremy Young's most significant change is the introduction of a woman, Heinrich's wife, as the compassionate executioner. This is particularly noteworthy in alteration given the improbability of Heinrich ordering a female to carry out the murder, let alone his own wife and the Emperor's sister. A wax image is also buried rather than a condemned criminal. The final section of Jeremy Owens parallels a number of oriental tales whereby a king seeking explanation of a puzzling incident such as a dream uncovers the illicit behaviour of his queen. A medieval Latin story from a 13th century compilation collected by Wieselski under the title The Affide Kernigan tells how the king of Sheba hears a voice telling him his queen is sleeping with an ape. He orders all the apes to be killed, but the warnings continue. A wise maiden then uncovers the queen's lover who is disguised as a maid. The wise maiden then goes on to marry the king and they have a daughter who is in fact the legendary queen of Heber who visits Solomon. In Dremion's, the queen's lover is a serving man rather than a serving woman in disguise. So overall it seems safe to conclude that much of Dremion's plot is of eastern origin. Margaret Schlauch suggests the saga has given a northern setting to professional seers, wise viziers, harems, concealed lovers, and rival ministers, such as one encounters in the Arabian Nights. The author's own changes are notable for their presentation of Christian morality. John provides a model of modesty and forgiveness throughout. He lays no blame on the Earl's wife when she enters his bedroom to kill him, and he later intervenes on Earl Heinrich's behalf, even though Heinrich has pleaded to kill him. And when the Queen's adultery is revealed, he begs the Emperor to follow the Lord's example and to be merciful. Similarly, Farmer Asgard serves as an exemplary generous farmer who shares his crops in times of famine, when John assures him he's entitled to the valuables buried on his island, since he'll use them well, he certainly does, and he goes on to share them generously. But the author also manages to inject a pessimistic note. When John hears he's been praised to Heinrich by Asgaus, he immediately foresees his doom, yet he nevertheless submits to it. Such submission to an inescapable fate 
there are common traits of Scandinavian literature isn't unique to it. But neither is John's fatalism necessarily Eastern either. As with his other sources, the author skillfully woven oriental stories and themes into an authentic northern courtly adventure. <clears throat> so, um, my edition of Drawing the Yellow Saga is based on the AM657 AB Quarto manuscript housed at the Arna Magnin Institute in Copenhagen. It's a 100 leaf feather manuscript that measures about 22 by 17 centimetres and dates from the mid to late 14th century. Perhaps circa 1375, though, might be earlier. The manuscript consists of a small number of longer texts and a significant number of short texts, including a large collection of Islandic Eifintiri, or Icelandic adventure. And as I said earlier, Although Dream of Young Saga has traditionally been counted among the Riddler Saga, it's considered by some closer in spirit to these Islandic Eifin theory. So it's not all that difficult to see how it's ended up being collected in the volume alongside them. Four separate hands have been identified in the codex. Dream of Young Saga itself is written in a single hand a Gothic cursive hand known as Cursiva Antiquior or, or Lessi Script. In my thesis paper, I also wrote at some length on the provenance of the manuscript and possible identity of its compiler or translator. Um, I'm not going to go into the details here. Suffice to say that many of the texts in the manuscript including Dreamyons, have been plausibly linked to the Benedictine abbot Berger Sockerson, who was elected abbot at Monkathvera in northern Iceland in 1325, and also to his contemporary Angrimia Branson, who attended the monastery of Thingira in northern Iceland. There seems good evidence to suggest that one or both of these two particular authors, to use the term loosely, perhaps working in an environment at the monastery of Thingera, collected and translated the texts that make up this codex, which is essentially a collection of exemplars. The saga itself occupies nine leaves, uh, nine leaves of the choir's nine and ten, running from line 10 of 58 verso to the bottom of 62 verso, with each leaf having 33 lines of text in a writing area of 15 and a half by 12 centimetres. The saga itself is a little under 4,200 words. About 80 words are missing from the end of the text, uh, from the end of the saga, which cuts off at the end of 62v. Below this, written in a different hand in Icelandic, is Vantat Verbluth. Two pages are missing. These two missing pages are the middle of the gathering, the first of which must have contained the end of the saga. High resolution photos of the manuscript are available online at the website handwrit.is. And those were the images that I use for uh, this project. So, this is the first page of the saga. And it starts with the pen flourished initial H in blue and red. And this extends uh, well down the page and into the margin then you should be able to see the unseal E, uh, then I, N, R, E, close K, R, E, R for air, and M 
with the little R abbreviation above. Don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, which is an abbreviation for matter. So it's in reasonably good condition overall. Some pages are more readable than others. Um, this is one of the better pages. But this one, um, uh, Photo 60 is about the most difficult to read. Um, it has a cushion fold at the top that affects both sides and a significant piece cut from the bottom margin by the spine, which you can see here. Um, so losing loses some of the text on the last two lines. Um, there's also vertical damage running down the middle and damage in fading near the spine on the bottom third, especially on the, uh, the verso side here on the slide. So quite often it's possible to work out some of the characters or at least have a good guess. If you gaze at it long enough, I also found, um, I found that playing around with various Photoshop filters can also help a bit. Um, but there are some words, though, thankfully very few, that are just impossible to make out and so it marks up in the text as such as unreadable. So I'm just going to finish up by saying a little bit about how I actually created the Minota encoding. Now, uh, Richard Rowling did a terrific Minota project for his hidden thesis a few years ago. And uh, that actually gave me the inspiration for this one. Richard's thesis theater has a much better explanation than I could on the process of creating a Minota encoding which he did by transcribing text directly into an XML file using the Oxygen XML editor. But I decided to take a different approach with this project. Rather than directly typing in XML, I decided to transcribe the text into a text file using my own markup to indicate things like new pages, start of a new line, abbreviation characters, gaps in the text, unclear sections of text, and so on. Now, there's an unofficial Minota tool called Minota Bullets, which essentially does much the same thing. You basically transcribe the manuscript into a text file, marking it up with what's termed Minota Bullets code. You then run the transcribed text file through the program and it will output the correctly form formatted XML. But when I started this project, my notebooks wasn't all that well documented. So I decided to create my own instead. And another factor was that rather than transforming the text straight into XML, I wanted to load my text into a database so I could manipulate and query it as I built the diplomatic and normalized layers. So this slide shows a transcription of the first few lines of the saga using my custom markup. Beginning with the at character marking chapter one, um, I marked up the chapters to match those in pages edition of the saga, by the way. Um, so then after the at character that marks chapter one, um, then there's an exclamation mark um, followed by the page in the manuscript and the slash um, and the uh, line 10, where the line on the manuscript where the saga starts, a curly bracket, um, marks the first word as the name with the P indicating it's a person's name as opposed to a location name. 
The name Hein Wrecker also starts with a pen, pen flourished initial H. So that's delimited with the double asterisks. Many of the transcribed characters are non standard characters that aren't part of the standard Latin alphabet. And these are entered into a file in what are termed XML entities. So these begin with an ampersand character and end with a semicolon, such as you can see here the ampersand e unc, uh, and also the k close in the name Heinrecker. So that second letter is an unsealed form of the capital letter E, and the K is a closed form of the letter K. The ampersand R sub semicolon um, at the end of the first line is an abbreviation mark. So it's enclosed in single asterisks in my markup scheme and represents a small letter R, which will appear above the M. Another one you can see all over this extract is ampersand I no dot semicolon, since none of the letter I's in the manuscript have a dot above them. I should just say that I didn't have to type in all these entity references in full every time I needed one. The text editor I use has a clip library where I can just open up the list of the ones I need and double click on the relevant one to insert it into the text. So jumping ahead, this next slide um, shows how the first few lines of the text will actually be rendered once the markup is applied and the XML entity is replaced with the appropriate characters. So you can see the highlighted initial first letter, the unsealed letter E, the closed K, the little superscript R abbreviation above the M in the third word. Then there's a closed F in the next word and the saga title, which appears in the middle of the first line and is written in red and so on. So going back to the transcribed text file um, that I showed in the previous slide, the next step was to write a program that could read it and store it in a suitable database table. So here's a snapshot of the database. The fax column, this one, has an entry for each word or punctuation mark in the transcribe text file. The asterisk markup for abbreviations has been replaced with the appropriate embedded Minotra XML ta tags as the database was loaded. Um, so as there's other uh, embedded markup, such as the highlighting of the H character in the first word of the text, and here's the, one of the abbreviation marks where the asterisks have been replaced. So at this point, it was possible to write some more code to read the database and output a fully compliant Minota XML file that represented the facsimile text layer. The next task was to fill in the DIPL and NORM um, columns and the lemma column, uh, which is over here. Uh, for the, which contains, the lemma column contains the dictionary form of the word. So I could generate diplomatic and normalized texts. Most of that work was tackled with spreadsheets. The first and main one was created by extracting all the unique facsimile layer words from the database, against which I could enter the diplomatic and normalized equivalents and the lemma. So this slide shows an extract from the beginning of the spreadsheet, which this is the words in descending order of frequency. So you can see the most frequent word after the full stop is the Tyrolean et abbreviation for and with 148 occurrences. 
The idea is that once I completed the spreadsheet, I could import it back into the database and use it to update my main table. So I didn't have to type in OK several hundred times. Have to be a little bit careful with this though, because the memory in particular can often vary for the same facsimile word. So for example, air could be the relative particle meaning when, where, who, which, that, etc. Or it could be the third person singular of the verb vera to be. And occasionally the diplomatic and normalized words can also change for the same facsimile word. So, for example, the scribe in this saga often used exactly the same abbreviated word KAIS, K E I S, for Kaisery or Emperor, irrespective of its particular case form at that point in the text, such as Kaiseranum, Kaiseran, Kaiserans, and so on. So, I kept another spreadsheet that kept track of those exceptions. And I also used three more small supplementary spreadsheets specifically for the normalized text. Um, the first is to import, sorry, to insert new rows into the database for additional words and punctuation that was unique to the normalized text and interpreting the other layers. You can see all the line positions um, have decimal numbers so they can be inserted between existing words. Um, another similar table recorded where words and punctuation in the diplomatic text needed to be altered in the normalized text. So for example, capital, capitalizing words after full stops or in names and places and altering punctuation marks. And finally, a table marking out sections of text which should be displayed in speech marks. So once all loaded back into the database and used to update the main table, I had all the information needed to generate an XML file that contained all three layers of text. So here's the main database table now with the diplomatic and normalized and lemma columns filled in. On the fifth row, for example, you can see where a punctuation mark here has been added to just the normalized column. So it's then simply a case of running my code to generate the XML. Um, and the final XML file that it produced turns out to uh, run to about 32,900 lines in total, which perhaps gives you some idea why I didn't want to code it all by hand. So here's a snapshot of the start of the XML. Um, after the file had been loaded into an XML editor. Um, within each choice tag, you can see which word represents which layer um, of text. And at this point, you can apply various star sheets to the XML to format in different ways. My text hasn't been submitted to Minosa yet, but I did a kind of reverse engineer on their website to produce something that shows how the text will appear. So if I can just switch over. Uh, to my web browser. Find it. Yep. So starting with the facsimile layer, this is displaying the text that I've produced. This is the first um, page of the facsimile text running from line 10 to line 33 on uh, page 58V. Um, so I can page through the different uh, pages of facsimile text or 
jump to a particular page, so there's the last page. But I can also switch on the different layers to compare them side by side. So that's the diplomatic layer. Um, just get back to the first page. Um, you can see the abbreviations have been expanded. So the M with a little R above it has become Mazra. Um, the Tyronean X has become OK. Um, and the normalized layer. Switch off the fax layer. Presents a um, as I say, uh, more modernised. Uh, for it takes more suitable for the for the modern reader, and I can also include the translation as well. And um, oh yeah, and also, if you hover over any of the words, it shows the dictionary form of the word, um, which is the the lemma column as I talked about. Um, and that basically is, is it. So, Phil, if you put your cursor over the diplomatic or facsimile edition, does it also go to the lemma? Or is it yeah, only it on does. the... No, it does? It does on, on all of them, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Put the uh, facsimile back on as well. Let me show them. The only ones it doesn't uh, do it with are where the um, uh, text has been corrected or supplied by the, the editor. Um, so it's only where a complete word is um, being found in the manuscript. Uh, and that's basically done so that you're not um, including anything in somebody who's doing a lookup um, that, that may have been supplied rather than actually uh, read from the text. So, Phil, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the work behind this and how long it took you to produce all of this text. And this is, for a saga, relatively short. It's in the yeah. me medium range of length of sagas, how long roughly would you say it took just to even get through the facsimile layer? It took most of the first part of the, the, um, the well, the first semester of the um, thesis to produce the facsimile text. And um, that was the biggest challenge, just working through the actual manuscripts and uh, identifying all the different letter forms and encoding them. Um, it got easier as it went along until you come across uh, a page like the one that I showed in the, the presentation, uh, which was very difficult to see what was going on in, in there. Uh, and I also did the translation fairly early on um, because that helped as well with identifying uh, certain words. So initially I did a rough translation using the text from one of the other editions that I talked about and had that to kind of guide me a little bit through uh, um, working out the, the old Icelandic text. And in doing so, didn't you kind of have to figure out the normalized form and then work backwards towards the diplomatic? Or was it more of a process of, here's the manuscript, here's my facsimile idea, here's what I believe it stands for, and then try to make yeah. it into some functional yeah to a large extent the diplomatic was probably the easier because it was mainly i've kept the spelling pretty much the same it's just expanding the abbreviations largely and changing some of the letter forms um so that they uh, part of the, the latin alphabet um so things like the closed f just become a normal f um, and so on. So, uh, um, and then the normalized was a lot more challenging because it used the dictionary of old Norse prose, which is a little bit weird in places. Um, it tend, tended to do one or two things that I wasn't used to. So, um, 
a lot of the characters like the uh, the A literature have the um, accent for, for length. Um, so that took a bit of getting used to. Uh, and some of those forms are quite different from how they look in the diplomatic uh, diplomatic text. Now I wanted to ask you in terms of taking this project to another to another step or not, would you be interested in looking at this as a for the linguistic evidence in terms of linguistic change over time? Uh, yes, that would be interesting. I mean, one of the things that I did want to set out to do originally as well was I've marked the the lemma for each word, but you can also do a. Um, a syntax markup as well just to mm. say what form each word is um you know it's like the verb noun and case forms and so on uh, but that is a fairly huge piece of work in itself as well yeah so that would be perhaps the first step and also as you say looking at the uh um, the actual language in more detail as well there are one or two form forms in there that seem more towards the sort of Icelandic than, than the old Norse that you uh, um, sort of retort, if you like. That's the first thing that I think we realize when we look at a real manuscript is that when, when one studies Old Norse, Old Icelandic, we, we learn an artificial literary standard yeah. from the year 1200 or so that only exists in about one and a half fragmentary texts. That's it. And the real texts are all, um, you know, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries onward into modern Icelandic. And we're dealing with a kind of artificial literary standard of the language. So it's it's probably the the most in-depth way to really learn Old Norse is to read a, a real manuscript and see the yeah, definitely. Yeah. big differences in spelling. Um, you can see, of course, some of the uh, linguistic changes and grammatical forms and, um, you know, vocabulary also. And I, and I think going back to the point about the, the blurry boundary that we have set, and this is a modern uh, distinction between Fornaldarsagar, the legendary sagas, and then the um, Riddarsagar, uh, mm -hmm. the chivalric sagas. That's it's something that pervades even the the most supposedly authentic of Old Norse literature. In other words, things like the sagas of Icelanders, um, you know, some of the more famous uh, uh, sagas of Icelanders or the family sagas. They're often called uh, like Lakstila saga. All of the descriptions of the the young, well, let's just say playthings of the heroine of the of the story, um, her two suitors, uh, main suitors, they, they describe their clothing. And that's not something that they would have done, uh, you know, without this influence from from chivalric literature. Uh, of course, this can all derive from oral tradition, and that's part of it. But it's a very unique situation that we find ourselves in with with this literary blend it's a hybrid really um sort of syncretic in one sense because they're taking themes and adapting them to the native literature uh, but it's but it, in the foreign of the Sogar, even some of the more famous ones uh i mean that distinction is really unnecessary to make um so among the most famous one the saga the volsungs that's the great Sigurd the Dragon Slayer, the legend. And we have tons and tons of, of pieces in there that have been derived straight out of Tristan Saga Ok Isund, Isundar. So the, the, the saga of Tristan and Isolt. That one is even in the saga of the Volsungs, which is held up in some ways as one of the most, you know, important of the Fornaldo Sagar. So for example, the entire story is more or less a fairy tale um, with the dramatic mm -hmm. death of the entire clan of all these different people. But uh, the the wooing of the of, of Brynhildr and behind the ring of fire, uh, also a description of Sigurd's armor that's definitely borrowed from classical literature and also the chivalric 
uh, literature that had been written in Norway and later told in Iceland. Um, but a good number of the pieces of that, um, you know, the, we make these distinctions in the modern era, and that was mostly 19th century, early 20th century. And we're finding ourselves now at a crossroads where scholars are finally paying attention to the most popular genre, which is this genre here that your saga is a part of. These were told in the surviving manuscripts attest to this. I mean, it's it's yeah. almost it's well over double of the the amount of uh, surviving manuscripts that contain Riddera Sagar over all other genres. So it, it's interesting that it was dismissed as foreign influence or foreign invading literature or something. Um, that was never the case for the people in Iceland and Norway, for that matter, during the Middle Ages. This was the most popular literature. This was their HBO of the day, yeah. for lack of a better description. They, they, this has, obviously, this particular saga, it's not the only one. It has a lot of themes that would be considered erotic in nature. It's not very um, direct in that sense. It's implied. Uh, but this is the type of stuff that would have entertained, especially clergy of all people, the most entertained by the by the erotic fiction of Oriental tales, um, you know, set in this particular northern landscape, um, like northwest Germany. But it is it, it's very interesting to find out what were people entertained by during this this time period, and it, their interests are not much different than our own today. Um, it, in fact, they seem to be, you know, right in line with what pop culture of the 21st century is obsessed with sex, violence, and, uh, you know, a little bit of drama. Um, it has all of that. And then here with the fairy tale, uh, uh, you know, the adventure tales um, or the folkloric background, really the fairy tale structure here. Um, that's something that absolutely would be universal. That's why the tale is found all around Eurasia. So yeah. um, there was one question here in the chat from Joe Hoffman. Do you, do you, do the characters think it's weird that Yon can see into other people's dreams? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, uh, other characters don't particularly mention it. It seems to be a, a given almost, but it is a, a rather strange thing. Um, yeah. I think it's funny because in old old Norse literature, native or translated or influenced or otherwise, uh, dreams have a high level of significance. Dream interpretation is probably a part of their indigenous culture, if we could call it that. But it seems to be a, a pan Eurasian thing. I think having the significance of dream readers, yeah, yeah. interpreters. So the fact that this tale traveled so far and wide you know attests to its its significance i think in oral tradition but what's most interesting about that transmission through oral tradition is that this is all written literature we get snapshots frozen in time of the of the oral variants of this you know across the millennia even for that matter so it is a very interesting saga and i did want to praise your work by the way phil this is absolutely stellar uh the level of textual presentation here how many layers there are all three layers and a translation i mean this is really top-notch stuff and i can't thank you enough for giving me the pleasure that an opportunity to oversee this thesis it was a it was a challenging one for both of us i think and that's good it's good to have those challenges and I'm, I'm glad to see that you have, were able to not only overcome this massive work, uh, but excel at it and, and pull off a project that it's absolutely the top, top of the line, I would say. So. Thanks. Okay, so does anyone have any more comments or questions? If anyone's interested in uh, having a look at the website, um, I'll drop the, the uh, address into the chat. Um. 
the uh, translation that's on there is my translation, but I've also added the ending um, if I go to the last page. Um, you can see at the point where the text cuts off, and then I took Daring's edition just to translate the rest, uh, the missing part. Um, it has another Christian message at the end. And unlike in a lot of translations of sagas, you don't do so silently. They do this silently in standard translations where they they don't tell you it's been taken from several manuscripts. And here it makes it very clear um, that it's it's Gatherings edition. Um, so it's but yeah, it's a very interesting tale story. And yes, definitely another reason to learn Old Norse. It's a very rich genre, very rich body of literature in Old Norse. One of the richest, I would say, of medieval Europe. Okay, well, I think we will we will end our presentation for the day. And I just wanted to thank you, Phil, for your wonderful work. It's been a pleasure working with you. And um, I hope everyone is able to follow along with your progress through the years after this. And uh, we'll keep in touch. So, yeah, thank you too for all your help uh, along the way with this. Yeah. Really enjoyed doing doing the project. It's been really good. Yeah, the the most intense learning learning even even for me uh, is reading these manuscripts during different different periods, and every single letter is a little bit different from hand to hand, from decade to decade. And wow, this was a doozy of a manuscript and very fun challenge for both of us. So, All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I uh, suppose I will end our session. And thank you, Phil, most of all. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And thanks for everyone for coming.